Well, I'm going to talk about the end time apostasy just to let you know I do believe the Bible talks about that subject. Uh, and we see that there's a future time we're probably at the end of the church age and you have the rapture of the church followed by uh, the judgment seat of Christ for believers in heaven, the marriage of the lamb. I think the marriage supper takes place in the millennium uh, when Jesus said that he would sit down in the kingdom with all of the different people to have people at the wedding reception party, so to speak, will be the, the other redeemed from the other ages <clears throat> and then you have uh, Jesus returning to the earth followed by that wedding reception at the beginning of the millennium then you back up and you see the events of the tribulation that are taking place during that seven year period and the abomination of desolation that takes place in the midpoint by the way I don't think there's a peaceful period in the tribulation, the peace is for Israel, not for the world. So I, I believe a lot of the seal, trumpet, and bowl judgments are going to take place uh, early on. So it, it looks like this. You have the rapture of the church. Notice that interval between the rapture and the beginning of the tribulation. And it starts as depicted by the white horse from Revelation 6, who heads up a uh, ten nation confederacy of the West, and he promises to protect Israel. And you have the apostate church in the Levit Jewish Levitical system uh, will play an important role during this time. And then you have the seal judgments, I think, in the first half, and the trumpet judgments in the first half as well. And so you're talking about half of the earth's population being killed during those periods. And it's Israel, however, is protected. I think a lot of people take that first half of pseudo-peace for Israel and apply it to the whole world when it doesn't, in my opinion. But, you know, I've been wrong before. And then you have Satan is cast out uh, by Michael the Archangel, as Revelation 12 talks about, and he's cast down and limited to the earth. The Antichrist, I believe, will be killed in the first half of the tribulation, he was simply demon-possessed in the first half. He'll be Satan-possessed uh, in the second half, where Satan will uh, possess him. He will be resurrected. It says that four times in the book of Revelation, the very same language that's used to describe the death and resurrection of the Lamb. And so I, I believe that that will... Uh, occur when God raises him from the dead to, in order to send a strong delusion upon those who love not the truth, the earth dwellers in the book of Revelation, and they will then be deceived through signs, wonders, and miracles. And therefore, you, the Antichrist goes global in the second half. The mark of the beast is required in the second half, and Israel is persecuted, and she flees to the wilderness, probably to Petra. And you have the worship of Satan, Antichrist. And that's what it means when it talks about him changing the religion of the fathers of everybody. In other words, it, it comes to basically Satan worship uh, during this time. And you have the bold judgments that precede the second coming, followed by the campaign of Armageddon in eight stages, which results in the second coming of Christ as we return with him at the second coming. So that's an overview of tribulation events. And as Dr. Walford used to say, uh, there's probably a greater volume of scripture that talks about the events of the tribulation than any other time period in the Bible, even more than Christ's first coming. And I mean, a person could write a novel series of like 18 novels and uh, have plenty of material to do that with. So, I believe what we're seeing today, we're seeing Israel in the process of fulfilling her return before the tribulation period that has begun. And we see that uh, the rapture of the church is further fulfillment during that interval afterwards as the nations get ready 
for the events of the tribulation, but it starts with the agreement between, whether it's a forced agreement or a negotiated agreement between Israel and the revived Roman emperor, empire starts a tribulation, and that's when you see the fulfillment of prophecy occurring. I, unlike many other prophecy teachers, I do not believe that prophecy is being fulfilled today except for preparation for fulfillment. And uh, that's, I don't take a part of the Olivet Discourse to refer to what's happening today like some do. And so I think all of that's going to happen in the tribulation. And therefore, we are seeing signs of the time. We are seeing uh, preparation. I always forget about Jesus coming back there. And uh, so we do see the stage being set for the mark of the beast, technology and all of that. Israel's back in the land. Russia is getting ready. She's in alliance with Iran and you know, in Turkey, all going to be part of the Gog and Magog invasion, which I think will take place after the rapture, but before the tribulation. Preparation for the temple being rebuilt. If you recall, Randy Price and I, I think it was 94, came out with a book called Ready to Rebuild. Uh, my Arab neighbor didn't like that book. <clears throat> but nevertheless, Babylon's going to be rebuilt at some point and become the capital of the Antichrist at some point during the tribulation. Globalism is all over the place. I think this last election was nationalism versus globalism here in the United States. And believe it or not, nationalism won. And God has decreed nationalism after the flood in the Tower of Babel that nations should do this and we should not have a United Nations building like they did in Babel again. And of course, but the intellectual people in the world all want globalism because they see nationalism as the source of all the wars of the 20th century, which it was not. It was other factors, but nevertheless, that's how they see it, and that's what most intellectuals believe in the world today, and many people as a whole, they want to have a global government. And we see Jerusalem is back under uh, Jewish control. And the Middle East is being reformed. The Israel's ancient enemies since the breakup of the Ottoman Empire are being uh, reconstituted. And we see the European Union, uh, the effort to bring it together. And even if it falls apart, I think the Antichrist will come in and bring it together. But they're even trying to do this even in our own day. Let me quote you a nursery rhyme. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men could not put Humpty back together again. That nursery rhyme is a summary of European history for the last 2,000 years since the breakup of the Roman Empire. I had a debate at Oxford in 2007, and I quoted that nursery rhyme. And I'm sorry I didn't have a British accent when I did it, but nevertheless, uh, I was trying to get across the fact that the European Union is reforming what they've been trying to do since the break of the Roman Empire. And so we're going to see a revived Roman Empire at some point in the future if we're not seeing it uh, formulated today. And we see the church age. And we, an overview of the church age is that it began on the day of Pentecost, as we know in Acts chapter 2. And... It is a time, uh, you had the destruction of the temple in AD 70 and the end of the transition from Israel to the church. And you have the continued growth of the church where it becomes global and at the same time increasing apostasy. And that is something I want to deal with tonight is the idea of apostasy. And so you see the church gets bigger and bigger. It's the large... Christendom, which includes anything related to Christianity, Romanism, Greek Orthodox, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, all of Protestants, everything, is the, by far the largest religion in the world, not Islam, even though they keep lying about it in the news, that there, there's probably uh, 75 to 100 million more uh, Christians in the world than there are Muslims. And so that ends with the rapture of the church. Yes, Jesus is going to rapture us one more time here. And we're out of here. And so the only prophecy per se 
that's a real historical event that the church is looking for is Christ at the rapture that ends the church age. And I talked about this throughout the day, that the church age is a temporary time of co-equality between Jew and Gentile in one body. And God has to take the church out. And that's why the rapture is part of God's plan that he began revealing the night before he was killed in the upper room discourse uh, in order to fulfill the unfinished 70th week of Daniel. Pre-tribulationalism makes so much sense in light of this when you look at the purpose, stated purpose in Scripture of the church. And so uh, Paul predicted in Acts 20, 28 through 32, that apostasy would come. He said, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Now he gathered together the Ephesian elders because he had spent three over three years there, more time in Ephesus than any other place during his missionary journeys. And he rented out, we know from scripture, a uh, meeting hall. And while everybody was taking, they take siestas over there in the mid afternoon. And he would lecture or teach or preach whatever he did, reason with them about the gospel. And as a result, it went all throughout Asia, meaning Turkey. Modern day Turkey was called Asia back then. And uh, so he wanted to see those elders one more time and they met him as he was leaving the area. And he said to be on their guard for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. And uh, that's the word for shepherds. Uh, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you. In other words, they will arise from within uh, those who profess to be believers, not sparing the flock, and from among you, your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things. He's most concerned about false teaching and false doctrine, because false teaching and false doctrine always lead to wrong behavior and uh, leads to the lack of the spread of the gospel, the lack of the maturing of believers, et cetera. And so this is what pastors or shepherds are supposed to do, is teach the word and guard the flock. And nobody ever talks about that much anymore. And we're seeing this in decline even in our own day. Uh, and, and, our, and the reason they're going to speak these perverse things is in order to draw away the disciples after them. In other words, they want to become famous and well-known. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up, edify is the word, can also be translated that, and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified or set apart, in other words, believers. And so Dr. Pentecost says, this condition at the close of the age is seen to coincide with the state within the Laodicean church before which Christ must stand to seek admission. And so many people believe the seven churches, after we've pretty much gone through it, you can look back and see that they're types of the seven phases of church history, seven movements of church history they're called, and that the Laodicean, the final church, uh, Christ is outside the church knocking and uh, seeking admission to the church, not individual believers, but to the church has become so apostate that in a sense, the church is vomited into the tribulation uh, as part of the false church system that the Antichrist uses. It, in view of its, clo uh, of its close, it is... Not surprising that the, the age is called an evil age in Scripture twice. This current age is called an evil age. And so you see a church age apostasy is said throughout the New Testament to include sometimes a denial of God. And by the way, what we're talking about here is not what's happening in the world. Get that out of your head. It's what's going to happen in the church, in the church. And we can talk all day about how bad it is in the world. It's always been bad in the world, but the church is not supposed to bring that type of teaching and behavior into the church. That's what apostasy is. It relates to false teaching and immoral behavior, false teaching and immoral behavior. 
in the church. And uh, you see a denial of God, a denial of Christ. You see a denial of Christ's return, a denial of the faith. In other words, the doctrine that the apostles had delivered, the denial of sound doctrine or healthy doctrine is what that means, a denial of the separated life. Yeah, you can live any old way you want as long as you accept Jesus. Uh, denial of Christian liberty, you know, uh, legalism here. Denial of morals and a denial of authority uh, among the church leaders. And when you look at Paul's epistles, the order in which he wrote them, as I alluded in their discussion this afternoon, his early epistles were written from about 43 to 56. He wrote Galatians right before the Jerusalem Council, and then First and Second Thessalonians, where he taught the church's eschatology. And then 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians followed after that. And, and Romans capped it off. And then his middle epistles, from about 60 to 56, you have the prison epistles like Ephesians, Colossians, uh, Philemon, and Philippians. Now, Ephesians and Colossians are very similar. They're brother and sister epistles. Just like Galatians is the condensed version of Romans, uh, so they're similar as well. And then you have his late epistles, A.D. 63 to 65. And you have the, the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, then Titus, and 2 Timothy. And these are the epistles that where he really emphasizes false doctrine. And he, he's writing to pastors about how they could, should build the church. You don't need a church growth expert. You know, you've heard, Joe, these guys that come in and they do an analysis, you know, your drinking fountain is too high or low, or, you know, you need 12 new parking spaces. Your foyer's not big enough. You know, this kind of analysis in churches. Uh, when Jesus examined the seven churches, he had a little different agenda. Remember? It wasn't about any of that kind of stuff. But this is what you get from the church growth folks if you hire them to do an analysis of your church today. Uh, you know, you need two greeters instead of one. Uh, you need someone at your back door. You know, that, that's the kind of stuff. Nothing to do with the spiritual condition of the church. And that's why I would recommend if you get somebody to evaluate your church, get the seven letters. And uh, Jesus Christ, he does a really good job there, although it can be difficult. But as he is, Paul is about to die, his whole focus is, is, is concern is about the church. We want them to continue carrying on the legacy that Christ gave to him as he established many of these churches. And so that's where you have, he says in 1 Timothy, I've, I'm writing you to tell you how to set in order the things in the church. And you have all the warnings about apostasy and everything. And so I put this up during our discussion this afternoon. And here are the seven major passages that speak about apostasy. And this doesn't include the book of Revelation. There's a lot of apostasy mentioned in there as well. And so you see 1 Timothy 4, 2 Timothy 3, 2 Timothy 4, James 5, 1 through 8, which is the oldest epistle, but a warning there. And then you see, let not many of you become teachers because you incur the stricter judgment. That's in chapter 3. 2 Peter 2 uh, Peter gets in on the act, and so does Jude, uh, 2 Peter 3, and then Jude, the whole book. <laughs> it's a real Debbie Downer, you know. And in 1 uh, Timothy 4, 1 through 3, he says, but the Spirit explicitly says that in the latter times, the latter times of what? The latter times of the church. He's writing to the churches. So this is talking about something that's going to take place toward the end of the church. That's what that phrase means. Some will fall away from the faith. Now, Jude talks about how there's apostasy even in their day, and many of the letters, earlier letters like 1 John and others, deal with false teachings and things that are in the church. So it was there from day one, but it's going to get even worse. Um, as he says in 2 Timothy, evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse. Keep in mind, he's talking about in the church not in culture and society, although it may be getting worse in culture and society. He is saying this is what's going to happen in the church. Uh, 
paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. In other words, the source, because this is a spiritual warfare, is from demons. In fact, the Bible teaches two or three, four or five places that false teaching comes from speculative thought. It's the Greek word dialogue. We get our English word dialogue. Well, I wonder if maybe the world just happened to come into existence. Well, if that's true, then that means probably the flood of Noah wasn't global, you know, et cetera. And you go on these specula speculative chains of thought about things unaided by Revelation. See, biblical Christianity is rooted and grounded in Revelation, not the book of Revelation, but in Scripture, thus saith the Lord. There are things that we could never have figured out, the Bible says, had God not revealed them. And so they will move away from the Scriptures to, specula to speculative thought in different areas. And as a result, they'll fall away or depart from the faith. And the, the source, ultimate source of these are demonic beings who influence the thought patterns of these false teachers by means of the hypocrisy of lies seared in their own consciousness with a branding iron. In other words, the problem with it, someone who's deceived is they don't know they're deceived. That's why they're deceived, you see. And if they knew they were deceived, they wouldn't be deceived, right? You got that? Okay, good. And here it's like a conscience. See, your conscience is your umpire where you evaluate and come to conclusions of whether something's right or wrong. And uh, so a seared conscience, because everybody, as we know in Romans 1, knows God. Everybody knows God because they're metaphysically created in his image and they have a God conscious. The problem is they're fallen creatures also, and so they exchange the truth of God for a lie. They worship the creature rather than the creator. But the Bible says they know God. Who, who, who are you going to believe on this? Some you know, philosopher like Norm Geisler or somebody like that who says that man is not, uh, doesn't have this type of understanding, or are you going to believe the Bible? I'm going to believe the Bible every time. And so, uh, like a branding iron... And that destroys the nerves when, you, when, you, when a branding iron hits an area, you see. And so that means they, they lose the capacity of their conscience uh, over time. Men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods, which God has created to be great, uh, gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. And we got a lot of that kind of stuff going on. I mean... You know, at the Roman Catholic Church on the first thing, and then we've got all kinds of cults in America that were built on certain diets and foods, like the Seventh-day Adventists. I, I don't want to get off on that, but uh, they're, they were into all kinds of health food back then. And you can see I'm not a fan of health food, or I'd be more healthy. But nevertheless, <laughs> um, I heard a pastor say one time, uh, if you eat, the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. He says, so you may die healthy, uh, but it's not going to add any time to your life. Well, some people don't like that statement, but nevertheless, I'm moving on here. <laughs> Second Timothy 3, 1 through 5 says, but realize this, that in the last day, so it's picking up on that same theme that we saw, you know, in the previous verse, where it's... Um, or did I skip something here? Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm sorry. Of course, you already know that. Pretty sorry. But, uh, yeah, in 1 Timothy 4, he, he said that in the last days, the Spirit explicitly says uh, that the thing, false teaching is going to come. And now he says in 2 Timothy, his last epistle, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. And he's right. Who's he writing to? Pastors. It's going to be difficult to be a pastor. Why? Because people aren't going to want to follow you. <laughs> They're going to want to do go their own way and do their own things. It's like herding cats or something, you know? Everybody going their own direction. And he says, for men will be, and he states... Lovers of self, 
And then he describes what that means, and he ends that segment rather than lovers of God. And this is what we call in grammar an inclusio. You say at the beginning and the end your main idea, and the sandwich in between is what it means to be a lover of self rather than a lover of God. And so he's saying this is going to characterize much of the church in the last days. And so what it means to be a lover of self rather than a lover of God is a lover of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents. That's not happening today, is it? Ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, he includes everybody, <laughs> without self-control. By the way, this is the only time self anything in the Bible is used in a good sense, self-control. Uh, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And he spells it out. And just in Joe and my lifetime, we have coming into the church the doctrine of self-love or self-esteem. In fact, Joe, when I was a pastor, I got a free copy of that book on the right, Self-Esteem, the New Reformation. And some person paid for Brother Bob Shuler. I shouldn't call him brother. But nevertheless, Bob Shuler, who, by the way, fired his son who took over after him because his son occasionally would preach the gospel. You know, and he got rid of him. And uh, <clears throat> so I got my copy of that book, Self-Esteem, the New Reformation. I read it. He said, you know, the reformation of the form, reformers and all that was bad, but he's starting a new reformation of self-esteem because all those people believed people were evil and sinful and fallen. See, if you're evil, sinful, and fallen, then you need, what's your solution? The gospel, right. But if your problem is just self-esteem, you just need a better self-image, right? And you need to think better about Look in the mirror every day, like that senator from Minnesota, you know, every day, every way, I'm getting better and better, you know, when he was on Saturday Night Live. And we see that when you trace this back, Frederick Nietzsche, who was an atheist who believed that God was dead, I think he was the first to say that, uh, a German theologian, came up with the idea that since God is dead, then the highest creature on planet Earth is man. And in the same way, historically, that people have believed they need to love God because he's the highest creature in the universe, now man needs to learn to love himself. Thus, self-esteem came along. And I remember reading a guy who wrote a dissertation on this saying no one before Nietzsche uh, had ever brought the idea of self-esteem or self-love into the church for 1,800 years. It's a modern invention. we got to love ourselves. And so Schuler brought it from Nietzsche to the United States and I remember in the 80s, it took over in the 80s, somewhere around in there. No wonder the revival of the 70s died out in the church. This is in the church. You can go to bookstores now, and they got a whole 12-step, uh, how to reform yourself, you know, whole Sunday school classes on 12 steps and all, how to get over this and how to get over that. Look, this is, the Bible says what you need is sanctification, to, to live the Christian life, and you'll be able to handle life. And you start by loving God and loving others. There's two commandments, not three. It says that, that you already love yourself, you take care of yourself, you groom yourself, etc. And the issue is we have a hard time loving God and loving others because we're fallen sinful creatures. And when you become a believer, you're given that capacity to do that, but you have to choose to do that. And so uh, you see this kind of self-centeredness in the church today. And um, so 
we see another passage in time of, uh, related to end time apostasy in the church in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 5. It says, but realize this, in the last days, difficult times, we've already we just talked about it, for men will be lovers of self rather than lovers of God, holding, and that's described as holding to a form of godliness, an outward form of godliness, you know, religious trappings and everything, or some apparent uh, attractiveness that a person may have physically, although they have denied its power. What's the power? The power of the gospel. The power of Jesus Christ to change lives by trusting in him and forgiving our sins. Look, our biggest problem isn't that we need to change our lives. That is a problem. Our biggest problem is we need forgiveness of sin. And you can you can have all kinds of uh, change your life uh, little uh, seminars and all this kind of stuff, and you may change your life. Some Hindus and other people are able to do that. That's That still won't pay for your sin. You need a Savior to pay for your sin, and he will also change your life if you uh, follow him. And so, ho- uh, there, although they have denied its power and avoid such men as these. In other words, within the church, he's saying, and, and, and this means don't go to bad churches if you're a believer. Don't stay at a bad church that's not teaching the Word of God. You need to go to good churches, churches that teach the Word of God. And in 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4, it says, For the time will come when they will not endure... And this word means to regard with tolerance, endure, bear up with, put up with sound doctrine, healthy doctrine as opposed to a rotten doctrine, basically. And, and it's about doctrine. It's what they're teaching. But wanting to have their ears tickled, this is the congregants, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. That's the word for lust there. And will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myth. So it's both the pastors and the congregation that he's addressing here in, in this church. And they will turn aside to myths. You know, like, oh, God used evolution. Right. You know, or Jesus really isn't God. You know, or he's a seer in the third tier or something, you know. These kinds of things, and I, I'll, I'll, you know, I've, I've got all kinds of examples from my own life of talking to people who follow this way. One guy told me one time when I was a college student that we uh, we all know the Bible. Let's get on to other things, you know. <laughs> well, he, obviously, he didn't know the Bible very well, but uh, nevertheless, and you have in the Old Testament uh, two trusts. Truth test, Treth, tooth treth. I've, I've been up pretty long time. Truth test number one is in Deuteronomy 18, 20 through 22. It says that if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams comes to you and he gives a prophecy and it doesn't occur, then you know he's wrong, right? That's the easy thing. But the more difficult one is truth test number two. In Deuteronomy 13, where he says, if a prophet or a dreamer of dream arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes true, concerning which he spoke to you, saying, and let us go after other gods whom you have not known, and let us serve them. In other words, in essence, that's what he's saying. So even if he does a miracle or anything, and it comes true, or gives a prophecy or prediction, and it comes true, but he's got false teaching... What are you supposed to do? You're right, stone him. That's the next passage. (laughs) Yeah. uh, If the case the NSA is listening, we don't really believe that today. Uh, You're supposed to drop kick him out of the church. You're supposed to, but, you know, unless he repents. Uh, So... It, it's w- the content of what someone says that's important here. You follow? And it, why? Because it says the Lord your God, talking to Israel here, is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart 
and with all your soul. There's no biblical word in Hebrew for mind. Heart is where all interactivities took place. And so that's as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You see, so 60% of the time in the Old Testament, heart refers to your mind. And so here he's talking about uh, what a person thinks. So that's very clear. And as you say, here's the stoning part in verse 5. It says, but the prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has counseled rebellion against the Lord, your God, who brought you from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery to seduce you from the way in which the Lord your God has commanded you to walk. So you shall purge the evil from among you. And yes, they ended up a rock pile. But there's not any examples in the Old Testament of anybody actually being stoned. <laughs> I, I'm not sure how much they really uh, did this. But the Apostle Paul was stoned. And today people get stoned in a different way, don't they, man? Yeah. But you have a similar New Testament truth test, as I like to call it. In 1 John 4, for us, 1 through 6, it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. Spirit means the, the, the motivating drive, just as the Holy Spirit, you know, blew on people, as 2 Peter 1 talks about, and pr produced scripture. So these false spirits somehow communicate their message through human messengers. He, and so you test the content of what someone says to see what kind of spirit is behind them. Because many false prophets have gone out in the world. See, that's the result of these evil spirits that influence people is prophet, prophecy, or thinking, or doctrine, or whatever. By this you know the spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you have heard that he is coming. So there he's talking about a future antichrist. He mentioned a future antichrist in chapter 2, but here he's talking about anybody that denies that Jesus Christ came in the flesh is an antichrist. And there's probably been millions of those out there over the years, and now is already at work. So the antichrist, plural, are already there, even though a future antichrist is coming you know, during the tribulation. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world, the Holy Spirit, you see. And they are from the world. Therefore, they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He's talking about the apostles here. As he In, in the first chapter, he talks about that uh, he who is not from God does not listen to us, but this we know, the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. In other words, by content, once again, when you sift through what this passage is saying, it's what is the content of what someone's saying. So you have to be a content-oriented believer to follow Christ properly, or you may get sucked in by false teaching and false doctrine. 2 Timothy 3, 10 through 17 says, But you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and suffering, such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. And indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now, this is the last epistle that he wrote. And indeed, all... Uh, but evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. So he's saying, cheer up, it's going to get bad before it gets worse. And therefore, as I was talking earlier about people who are deceived, they don't know it. That's why they're so sincere, is because they're deceived if what they're saying is wrong, no matter how it's presented. You, however... And here's the positive, finally getting to a positive passage here. Uh, people that listen to Bob Schuler can now listen. You, however, continue in the things that you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings. Talking to Timothy here, raised by his uh, grandmother and his mother, 
which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith. In other words, the gospel, that's what that is, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable. And here's the fourfold formula for teaching. In other words, that's, you've got to learn doctrine. Doctrine is an explanation of what the Bible is teaching. And by understanding doctrine, you're then able to uh, realize that you have a need for reproof in your life. In other words, to point out something that's errant in your life. And then thirdly, Scripture provides the ability to correct what is errant in your life. And fourthly, once you get it corrected, then you have a, a regiment of training in righteousness. In other words, you reinforce it by living it, training in terms of that. And so you have to start with doctrine. Otherwise, you, you won't understand why you're doing something wrong and how to correct it and then how to reinforce that in your life. And so he goes on and says uh, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. And the, the, the same uh, Greek word, uh, that's translated equipped here is the same word for training. And so, in other words, the Word of God provides the training that you need and also the equipment that you need in your life using the analogy of a soldier, the training and equipping to live the Christian life as a man of God. It's called the Word of God. And so, this is what the Bible teaches is going to happen in the last days. And certainly we are in these times, and this is something that's been relevant for many, many years. And so I uh, wanted to have as my last message something that the apostles valued, and that is warnings about the false teaching and false doctrine that's out there. Uh, because we are nearing this time, and as Christianity gets larger and large, Christendom gets larger and larger, it's going to increasingly become more and more apostate. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word that is able to equip us and train us for every good work. Thank you for pastors who teach the word of God faithfully and do not get caught off guard into trends and uh, what some call the latest move and uh, various things like this, but who diligently are involved in slugging away day by day, teaching and living the word of God. And we pray that you would provide more and more leaders for churches with those qualifications and interest. And we thank you for the apostle Paul and your working in his life and Peter as well, who warn us and advise us how it is that we should live uh, in the church age that we're living in today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.